So the astrology of the week of 6 June 2022 through 12 June 2022, it's very interesting because in uh, one sense, it's a very quiet week of astrology. There's not much happening. There's no ingresses, no stations, no aspects of the major planetary points that I like to look at. But in some ways, that's what makes that uh, this is a special week because it, it's this rare, quiet moment of astrology during a waxing moon phase, the first waxing moon phase out of eclipse season. So there's a lot of opportunities this week, some of the best astrology to get into life, get into the summer, late spring, and do a reality and do it well. So, you know, as I said, there's really not much going on. It's really just the moon this week that we're going to dive into and try to pick out a couple of lunar transits, some of the best moments this week, and maybe explore the charts. And that's the great thing about astrology. I've said it often is that um, we always have the moon. The moon is always moving. It's constant. This is built into the significations of the moon, the idea of fast moving, of changeability, but of foresight as well, because it's the thing we can look at when there's nothing else to examine what's going to happen in any given moment of time. And so we do have the moon this week. The moon has not left us. And so we'll take a look at a couple of charts. Just to point out, we start the week with a Leo moon. We get a Leo moon. Um, we've It's a Leo moon now as I record this. We're going to um, have that moon enter Virgo 821 in the morning, Central European time. Right out of the gate on Monday, we get this sweet, sweet Virgo moon, ruled, of course, by Mercury, now direct. So there's a sense of moving ahead with this lunar transit. Um, we then get a Libra moon on Wednesday, 1722, Central European time. That Libra moon is ruled by, you know who, <laughs> Venus and Taurus, lovely, lovely, luscious Venus and luscious Taurus, the earth component of Venus, that lovely, pleasurable side of Venus. And then we close this week, um, what is that, Saturday, actually that might be, see, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, is Friday, uh, Friday 2241 in Central Europe, and we get a Scorpio moon. We get a kind of a, a rougher Scorpio moon um, for the weekend, but good news is that the moon in Scorpio is ruled by Mars, Mars and Aries, and so there's some protection here, I think. Um, the principle that the moon will defer to its ruler maybe can give us some safety for the Scorpio moon that arrives this weekend, but that's the lay of the land this week. That's what you'll be kind of navigating. And this is a waxing cycle, increase, growth. You know, and again, I just want to underscore, I know I've already said it once, but this is the, maybe the best astrology of 2022. I've said it in a video. I said it earlier. I kind of alluded to it. It's quiet, but it's good uh, when it's quiet. I, I like to think about planetary aspects often as causing things in reality. They are dynamically active, especially hard aspects and square aspects. And so in a week where those don't exist, it's 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 like um, it's like the universe saying, okay, the seas have calmed. Go get into the moment that you want to be in. Go move reality in the way that you want to move reality. So the first chart I want to look at is um, the moon in Virgo. This is early Tuesday morning in Central Europe. It's 48 a.m. So right after 48 minutes after midnight here where I am in Central Europe, North America, you're going to be evening time, you know, just the sun's going down probably in some locations. But we'll have a um, this Virgo moon that just look at the chart. It's a beautiful, beautiful chart uh, averse to Saturn. We don't have that harsh Saturn in Aquarius that's dominated um, the astrology of this year, that's mainly because that Saturn and Aquarius has squared both eclipses. And so all the dynamism of the year, like I just said, comes back to Saturn and Saturn's role in Aquarius. Saturn last week stationed retrograde, so it took on main player status last week, and that was a pivot. And now that has settled. Saturn has calmed a little bit. It's moving backwards now. Um, it's averse to this Virgo moon. Mars, strong in Aries, a fiery, potent energy, but averse to this Virgo moon. So both malefics don't touch this Virgo moon. It gives this moon room to be free and to, and to do what it wants to do. The growth it would like to bring to the Virgo sector of our charts, the growth it would like to bring to the Earth sector of our charts, because the ruler of this moon, Mercury, is in Taurus making an overcoming trine, Mercury now direct, still on algal, still that rough algal energy. And so I would encourage you if you're using this moment, if you're digging into this moon to do something, you may want to pay reverence to to um, to women, to the um, you know the women in your life. Give deference. There are um, ways you can read into the algal myth and find the 
softness there and the kind of forgiveness and the protective features of algol you may want to just give deference to it even just read an article you can go into google and type in reinterpreting the algol story there's a bunch of writing on it but just feel into that a little bit this week be very careful as you do that because it's such a potent energy but just a deference as you use this virgo moon ruled by mercury mercury on algol to do some kind of action but so there's the overcoming trine from mercury one and then there's the overcoming trine um, by venus and in this chart the one i've picked here eight degrees or the ninth degree of virgo this moon um, is right on the descendant where i'm going to be you love having the moon on an angle this moon is applying very close the next aspect it makes is to that beautiful venus in taurus that that domiciled venus in taurus and the moon is ruled by egyptian term it's in venus's egyptian term so this is a lovely venus mercury moment uh, of a wax expansive moon and you know what can venus and mercury do uh, you read ancient texts very often there's artisanship that venus and mercury combinations can bring i always think of it as the film maker placement because filmmakers are seeking beauty often um, especially like well photographed films films that have a cinematographer or cinematography is given premacy but then editing a film is very mercury it's tedious it's i mean i edit these movies you know that i make and there it's a really tedious process to edit um, and that's the mercurial component mercury storytelling and communication too and you often want to use film to communicate an idea and so you know thinking about film or artisanship i think it's like firmicus maternus and some of these ancient ancient text that's you know it's like making jewelry to sell you know where you can combine the beautification of venus the adornment of venus and then the, the marketplace uh, of mercury and remember where it's earth signs this is the body this is the materiality and we're dealing with beauty and detail orientated creativity around our earthy beauty you know our, our virgo and our taurus so look maybe it's around your home maybe it's resource based maybe it's finance based i mean mercury is a planet of trading and money venus can sometimes be that too if you think about precious stones um i know modern and contemporary astrologers sometimes say venus is money i, I don't i don't go all the way um with Venus equals money, but I do think there's a component of what money allows us to tap into in terms of the Venusian. Often it's it's um, extravagant side to Taurus, and that requires money, certainly. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. I mean, we can lean into our Taurian with just the grass and a naked body. You know, I mean, you don't need to have a lot of adorn, adornment with, you know, wealthy uh, jewels or something like that. So just to come back, this is this chart, a verse to the malefics applying to venus very closely and the ruler mercury is well configured it's now direct um, i love this chart you know but for algol and but for the north node we can talk about that here having the north node so close to mercury and and venus co being co-present with venus we're not quite done with the eclipsed um, nature the activated faded nature of the fixed signs of 2022 and this election this chart doesn't quite escape that it's hard to escape that this year there's really not many charts where i think there's going to be some um, cancer moons later when mars enters taurus where we'll have some nice jupiter moon exchanges anyhow the point is is it's really hard to escape the eclipses and the fixed signs and we don't escape at this moment so this may be one drawback here the ruler of the moon both the rulers by egyptian term and domicile are co-present with that north node but uh, as i've been uh, thinking about recently working with some clients and seeing this almost every reading i do how potent the nodes are to change our lives for the better to take things away and to add things into life and so I don't know if the nodes are something to necessarily be afraid of. There's an inevitability to the lunar nodes. And it's, this is the astrology. This is what we get this summer, this kind of inevitable moment where it's configured here in one of the better elections that we can't escape this north node. You know, maybe this is a good place just to mention. Um, people ask me, I got a question this week, you know, how can I use your videos to benefit me week to week? How do I apply it to my chart? Well, um, the, the simple answer is it's hard. You really can't do it <laughs> um, because you, each chart is such a unique story that I don't have in front of me when I make a video. I could make you know 12 videos every week and say, here's the weekly astrology for 12 rising signs. I don't have the energy, the time, or the ability to do that. So 
you know, what I try to do is general delineation for the collective, you might say, collective reading. And those can have applicability. Certainly they're not as good as knowing your natal chart, knowing where this is happening in your natal chart, trying to figure out how a moment like this may apply to your natal chart. Where's your Taurus? Where's your Virgo? Um, the other thing about it is that I am in Central Europe. The charts I look at are um, different. You know, you might not be able to capture the moon applying to Venus so close and having the moon on the angles in some locations. You probably can, but um, it might be a little bit more difficult. You know, you won't get this exact chart where you are. And so there's that component of it is, is finding your location and rooting this chart there. And then the third thing I'll just say, I'm really not, I mean, this is a decent election. I kind of like this election actually. But when I pick these charts, it's more of just an energy. It's more of a vibe. And really what I want people to to get from it is thinking about like, um, just know the Virgo moon this week is a good moon and try to maybe plan something here Monday, Tuesday and into Wednesday. Um, if you're going to do something, you know, that's, you don't need anything more than that sometimes just know, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to shoot for that Virgo moon. Now. Yeah. It's good to know, get it when it's applying to Venus exactly for uh, a principle of electional astrology, but the Virgo moon's a great moon. That's one, that's really all I would like people to take away from the video, from the transits of the week. And I'd say this is the transit of the week um, for me. And the next chart we're gonna look at is really interesting too. It's, a, it's good energy. One thing about this week is the energy stays nice because the Virgo moon gives way to this Libra moon, which is ruled by Venus and Taurus, the only Libra moon with Venus and Taurus this whole cycle. So let's pivot to that. So you can see here with the Libra moon, I have picked early, early degrees of Libra. I wanna try to get the moon applying to Jupiter. So this is electional astrology 101, uh, moon applying to the benefics. You want the moon separating from the benefics. Jupiter and um, Venus, get them involved, get them configured to the ascendant. So like in this chart, the other reason I really like it is that Jupiter is um, trying to the ascendant. It's in the fifth house here and the moon is applying exactly to Jupiter. Um, it's one ace in the hole. If you have to do something at any time, and let's say someone says you've got to act in the next four hours, wait for a rising sign where Venus and Jupiter can make a Ptolemaic aspect sign based to the ascendant. That is to say the third, fourth, fifth, seventh, ninth, 10th and 11th houses. Make sure Venus and Jupiter is one of those houses. And that's already a mitigation tool for how you can lean into an electional uh, moment uh, for your astrology. But here's the chart. And so that's the first thing to note. You get this lovely 11th house where I am, uh, 7, 1936 Central Europe, Wednesday, 7.36 p.m. You get the moon in the sweet 11th house. That's probably my favorite house to put the moon when I'm doing an election because I like the significations of the 11th, the good spirit. It's the joy of Jupiter. It's where we have, you know, good tidings, celebrations, gifts. It's where you find weddings sometimes can be 11th house themes. People come together to give gifts to celebrate someone. Patronage can come into the 11th house. It's groups that benefit us. It's, it's um, parties, really. Parties that are uh, well healed, you know, can be the 11th. And so I really love having the moon there when I do elections. And it's common in the tradition, the coronation of Elizabeth I elected by John D has the moon in the 11th house and does the um, uh, foundation chart of Baghdad. So our best electional astrologers in history have also used this moon and the whole sign 11th as a trick, as a way to get into a power kind of electional principle. Okay, so, um, but, but you get that in this chart, closely applying to Jupiter in this chart. The rising sign is Sagittarius, also ruled by that Jupiter. The rising is ruled by a benefic in its own Egyptian terms, Jupiter there in Aries. In its nitroplicity, the um, uh, moon is ruled by a benefic in its own sign, um, um, Venus. So there's a lot of benefic activation in this chart vis-a-vis -vis rulership for the two most important points we like to look at in elections. Um, you know, I just I would I would consider this to be again just the continuation of the Venusian theme of this whole week. This whole week, you might say Monday through Wednesday, Thursday, maybe Friday, when we hit that Scorpio moon. This whole week could be considered a Venusian bath, bathing in Venus, you know, putting the flowers in the bathtub, going to the park in your city. I can feel it now. I was just walking around outside. There's just a calmness. Now, Sundays here do tend to be calm, but I just feel like people, there's, there's not this kind of um, crisis urgency 
in the immediate air. And I just, I, I'm going to enjoy it this week. I know I'm going to have a great time taking the week off and I'm going to be just relaxing, doing a lot of Venus stuff and chilling and just really enjoying these transits as best as I'm able to. Um, but you have here that component of it. Um, I like that when we think about Libra um, bringing in this this trine to Saturn and Aquarius, Libra as this relational sign, but the more serious, heady side of the relationships. Maybe this is a good time to come to some agreements with a group or negotiate new terms with a roommate or a friend or a relationship, something that requires thinking and communication Libra can be good for. You get that Jupiter um, uh, opposition, which, which really does support the moon. So... Um, you know, the ruler of the moon, Venus, very powerful, averse to the moon, so maybe not ideal, but that's the nature of Venus. There's an aversion between the two signs that it rules, and that's built into Venus. I've talked about that before. I think it has to do with how in relationships sometimes we we need to focus on the other person. You know, we, we need to not be as um, distracted by other sectors of our lives. And so that's why Venus and Mars, the relational planets, uh, have these averse house rulerships. That's one theory. It's a theory I've liked. So, you know, that is really it this week. I'm shifting now. I'm, I'm going to just say this here, I guess. You know, my videos, I'm shortening them up a little bit. I'm really making some changes um, this summer with how I do everything. How I do all of my social media, trying to win back a little bit of work-life balance, trying to kind of... Um, relax a little bit to be honest and just chill with how I create content and not feel so much pressure and and not be so hemmed in with the burdens of being a social media content creator and an astrologer and a consulting astrologer with a busy practice you know and so my videos will be getting shorter and I'm going to I'm trying to make them shorter and include new content, new types of content. I wanna have new areas of coverage that aren't just the niceties of the astrology from week to week. I still like to cover the ongoing unfoldment of, it, of the astrological moment we're in at any given time, but I also wanna add new coverage. I mean, there's all kinds of ideas that I wanna share with the world, astrological you know, and, and divinatory, that um, being kind of locked into longer videos week in, week out, it really does take that free creative time from me. So you're going to see shorter videos here. And I um, just thank you for hanging with me and for kind of um, just being here. So take care. Have an awesome week. Use these two moons. Use this waxing cycle to do something new, fresh, initiate something in your life that you've been waiting to do. Take advantage of this astrology. It's beautiful waxing moon astrology. And I wish you all the best this week. I'll talk to you really soon.